You know, when I was preparing for tonight and thinking about uh, the season that we're in or the series that we're in, uh, Spiritual Fruit, tonight we're going to be talking about the word faithfulness. And I couldn't help but think about those who serve in this church who have been so faithful. Pastor Pauline being one of them, uh, and our worship team, our volunteers, you who serve, you've been faithful, you've been attending church, you've been giving. Like, this is a very faithful church. And so I am so glad to be a part of what God is doing. And even more, as we see uh, new people coming to know Christ, uh, our youth uh, rising up, and, and those who are rising up in leadership, I'm just so thankful that I get to be a part of an amazing church body. Like, I like seeing you guys. I like, I like coming to church. And I know being the pastor here, it's like, well, you've got to come to church. And I don't have to. I get to be here. And, and please forgive me when I'm out in, you know, in like the mall or someplace and you say hi and I forget your name. Please help me with that and, and you know, let's work together because you, you, you're going to know my name. That's easy because I'm only one person. So let's, let's try to work together and... Uh, and if I forget your name, then please forgive me. And I only say that as a prerequisite, just in case I do run into you and you're like offended. Which doesn't happen. I'm just saying. If it does, we've already made it clear. I don't even know why I brought that up. So let's turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And we've been in this series talking about spiritual fruit. If you have your, your church app, you can open that up too. And you're going to have the scriptures to follow along. And part of tonight in, in talking about the fruit of the Spirit is going through the nine traits of the spiritual fruit that God has, saying, has said to us that this is what can happen in your life when you come in contact with me and you develop this relationship with me. You're going to bear fruit. You're going to have spiritual fruit. And in Galatians 5.22, it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then it says, and against such things there is no law. Like, there's, there's no law, as Paul the Apostle was saying, there's no law that would be above these traits of the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, if you're following God and you're developing the fruit of the Spirit, and this is a part of your life, then there, it's not a, a, a lifestyle of what I do and what I don't do as being the laws of God. It's really a relationship with the Lord in Him bearing fruit through our lives with love, joy, peace, patience, and so on. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to require a relationship with God in order for us to bear fruit. And when it comes to this trait of faithfulness, although these nine traits put together is being said as the fruit of the Spirit, we can learn each individual trait of each part of the fruit of the Spirit. And tonight, being faithfulness, I, I thought about faithfulness and this trait of faithfulness, that it really comes down to where do we put our faith into? Who are we going to trust, and what is that going to look like? A trait actually is described as a distinguishing quality or characteristic, typically one belonging to a person. So if we want to develop this trait of faithfulness, then it has to, we have to own it. Like it has to belong to us. It's not going to be a part of some thought or maybe some theory or one day I'm faithful, the other day I'm not, or I'm going to have sporadic moments of being faithful or sporadic moments of having faith in God. No, this is a lifestyle. This is who God has made me to be. This is a character quality that we're going to possess as believers. I remember some time ago, I went back to Oahu. I grew up there. And one of the greatest joys of growing up on Oahu was having the Manapua man. And if you grew up on Oahu, that's, I mean, just think about it. Candy coming to you. That's like the greatest deal ever. Candy coming to you and, and manapuas like, and, and, and soda. And, and right after school or during summertime, they know when to show up. And you're, we're, we're unsupervised children. So they, all they have to do is play raindrops keep falling on your head. And we're mesmerized. And so we find the manapu man. And so as we were growing up, manapu man, and you had different ones. There's one, his name was Charlie, and with Charlie, you could charge, like you could run a tab. So because my mom had a tab, I could charge, and so it, my mom's tab would run up, and I would be like, hey, what you guys like? You guys like one, like one popsicle? And I, I was like, I was the man. I could treat people to gum, and it was cheap back then, right, because I'm, you know, 45, so back then you could buy a five-cent gum, and that was fine. But as time went on, I moved away, and I came here to the Big Island, and I was surprised that there was no monopole man. And I was thinking, why is there no monopole man? 
And then I saw how big the big island was, and there are no houses really close by because we're in Paradise Park. So you live on acre lots. So if a Manapo man went there, they'd lose money. So I go back to Oahu. This is years later. I go back to Oahu, and I'm not even thinking of the Manapo man because I already, it's like, it's like I lost hope when I came here that there was ever, never, ever going to be a Manapo man ever around. So I went back to Oahu, visited my mom, and then I heard the song. Raindrops keep falling on your head. And it's just this speaker outside of their truck, their van, and it's just, it's not even sounding good. There's no, you know, beats to it. There's no, there's no, you know, subwoofers. It's just this PA system, this megaphone, and it's just playing this. We could care less what it sounded like. All we knew was there was candy in it and there was manapu and other goodies. So I go back there and same person working. Same person, Charlie. And he remembered me. He said, hey, where you been? I said, where? I've been. You need, to, you need to diversify. You need to turn this into some kind of like a, like a, like a restaurant. You can have like different Manapua trucks and have different, you know, Charlies around. And then just, just duplicate yourself. I said, I'm on the big island. They don't have Manapua, man. You can make a lot of money on the big island. He said, no, too big the area. I said, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I said, hey, you still charge? My mom still don't have. He said, no, I don't charge no more. He said, I don't because people don't pay back. And, I, and, I, and after I saw him, I saw another lady, and this time Heidi was with me. And she saw me. She goes, oh, where you been? I said, I, I moved to the big island. And I'm like, well, you still do this? This is amazing. She goes, oh, yeah, I do. My children work with me now. I said, oh, it's so good. And she goes, this is your girlfriend? I said, no, we're married now. This is Heidi and I got married. And she goes, how many, how many children do you get? I said, I have, I have two children. I said, oh, my God, you're so young, you. I said, yeah, let's not talk about that. I'm just saying it's, it's so good to see you. And she goes, you still like noodle? I said, what? She goes, you still like noodle? I give you noodle. And I said, oh, yes. And, and it tastes exactly the same. Exactly the same. And I ate it, and I said, Heidi, you got to try this. And so we... We're sitting like in front of my house where I grew up, eating noodle from the Manapo man, reminiscing about growing up, remembering this woman. Now, if you did not grow up with the Manapo man, ah, putting. But <laughs> as I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, how faithful they've been throughout decades, because not everyone treated them nicely. Not everyone was smiley-faced when they came to approach the Manapo man or the truck. They had some fights. They had some people vandalize their, their equipment. They had some people steal from them, but they were so faithful. And then I thought, you know, when you have a passion for something, you're that faithful. And it reminds me of Christ himself. Just think about the life of Christ, how faithful he's been. And not just faithful in who he is in our life today that we know him, but faithful in who he has been since the beginning of time and then coming on this earth, having his ministry for three solid years and faithfully going to the cross. Faithfully. And I know in context we kind of say, well, you know, we put him on the cross because of our sin, but he said, no, I willingly lay down my life. No one takes it from me. I lay down my life. In fact, when he breathed his last, the Bible says he gave up his spirit. In other words, he was faithful to the end of his life here on this earth. Faithfulness, when we think of that word, we cannot help but to think about Christ. Because in order for us to have faith or faithfulness, we must put our faith into something that has stood the test of time when it comes to being faithful. And in order for us to exemplify the character, that trait of faithfulness, we must have a godly faith. Hebrews 11.6 tells us, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He's a rewarder. He's so faithful in rewarding us. See, faith and faithfulness actually come from the same root word. It means the character of one who can be relied on. And God's character can be relied on. In the New Testament, it means one who trusts in God's promises. One who is convinced that Jesus has been raised from the dead. One who has become convinced that Jesus is the Messiah and the author of salvation. So my question to us tonight to think through is this. Are we faithful people? 
Have we been faithful in our lives? Have we been faithful to God? Have we, have we been faithful with our words and the things that we say? According to our character, can we say we can be relied on? There's a, there's a geyser in the, uh, the National Park, uh, Yellowstone National Park, and I'm sure you've heard of it. It's called Old Faithful. And the reason why it's called Old Faithful is because this expedition that, was being, uh, that they were having in 1870, the washburn langford uh, Doan expedition, as they were camping there, they noticed that this geyser was going off every 45 minutes to about an hour and a half. And because of the faithfulness of this geyser, they called it Old Faithful. And I thought, boy, that's such an interesting way of naming something. But it makes sense. Why? Because it was consistent. See, when you're faithful, you're consistent. And I'm wondering if people would call us old faithful, not because we're old, but because we're faithful and we'll stand the test of time. And I, and I pray tonight that this word faithfulness would be one of the positive, not the negative, because we can, we can roll into the negative of faithfulness. But when it comes to God's character, the question is, can he be relied on? Can God's character be relied on when it comes to faithfulness? Well, Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 answers that question, and, he sa and it says this, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God not only possesses faithfulness, but his faithfulness is great. We can only have faith because he is faithful. However, here's the good news. Even when we're unfaithful, he still remains faithful. I mean, how, how often when we, when we are challenged with someone being unfaithful to us, maybe by their word or they, they had a promise that they, they broke or maybe they said they were going to do something for you and they broke their, they, their trust was broken or, or maybe someone said they're going to buy you something or meet you somewhere or do something for you and that was broken, that you said, well, if you're not going to be faithful to me, then I'm not going to be faithful to you. And that's a, that's a human way of thinking. But God says, listen, even when you're unfaithful, I still remain faithful. And the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 2.13, it says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. And here's why. Because he cannot deny himself. That's what 2 Timothy tells us. He cannot deny himself. In other words, his character quality, the very nature of God is faithfulness. He's faithful. He is our source of faith because faithfulness as a believer comes from our faith in him. And without faithfulness, there can be no life as a Christian. But when there is faithfulness, we can consider it pure joy, as James 1, verse 2 through 4 tells us. You can consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Now, I read that and I thought, wait a minute, it almost makes sense it would make better sense if it said, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you get a raise. Like, that would make sense. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you win a brand new car. Like, that would make sense. Or consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you lose weight just like that. Like, that makes sense. Like, you would be joyful in that, but the Bible is actually saying, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Now, it doesn't seem like we should consider it pure joy. We would, we would consider it pure, like, hard luck, bad life. Consider it, consider it the worst day ever when you encounter various trials. That would make sense. But really what the Bible is saying is here's why. Here's why you can consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And then it says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. And that last sentence, what it means is that you may be whole once again. You see, when it comes to our faith being tested, it's not just so that we can pass the test and say, oh, I passed this test and now I'm faithful. No, the Lord is saying, listen, I'm trying to make you whole again. Because life before me ripped you to shreds. And now that you've come to me, I have to make you whole once again. In other words, your inside, your soul is empty. 
It's filled with holes. I need to once again repair and mend and heal and make you whole once again. So you're going to be tested, but it's going to, you're, going to have, you're going to persevere through all of this so that you can be whole once again. And when you're whole, you're not going to lack anything. Everything you're chasing after to make your life feel better, you're not going to need all that stuff. Why? Because not, now your wholeness is in me. It's not in things, drugs, or, or any type of addiction. It's, it's now in me. It changes your entire life from the inside out. So the question is then, how can we live out faithfulness as Christians to a God who will always be faithful to us even when we're unfaithful? And here's, if you want to write some things down, here's the first thing. You've got to be in it for the long haul. Got to be in it for the long haul. It's a lifestyle. It's not, it's not just a, a one-shot deal that, God, I need your help, and then when he helps, and then I'm out. Okay, God, thank you very much. I don't need to go to church anymore. I don't need to fellowship with other believers. I don't need to give more to you. I'm good because everything's better now. No, we got to be in it for the long haul because it's a lifestyle. I've often heard it say that when the devil comes against us, he doesn't care what side of the boat we fall off of so long as we fall off. So when it comes to our relationship with God, being in the long haul means even though I fall, I get back up. I will continue to move forward no matter what. As human beings, faithfulness doesn't mean we're not going to make mistakes. Faithfulness just means that we're going to continue to persevere. Now here's the difference when we think of making a mistake or some people say, I've sinned. Or some people say, you know, I made a mistake. What's the difference? Well, here, here's the difference between a sin and a mistake. A mistake is you doing something without knowing it that is not necessarily a sin. For instance, you take an essay or you, you write an essay, and in your essay you accidentally put down your thesis statement wrongly. You just worded it wrongly. And you know you could have done better. You made a mistake. It's not necessarily a sin. You just made a mistake. Or let's just say you, you park your car uh, at the plaza, you go into the store, you come back out, you can't find your car, you call the police and come to find out your car was on the other side. And they went through all of that ordeal. And this is actually a true story. Someone told me this happened. And the cops came and everybody came. They did a report and everything and then car on the other side. It was just a mistake. It wasn't a sin. It was just a mistake. Now when it comes to a sin, there are actually two things when it comes to a sin. There is unintentional sin, and then there is intentional sin. Unintentional sin means it is actually a sin, but you just didn't know. You didn't know it was a sin. You didn't know that this was wrong. But when you came to know Christ, then you began to learn that, boy, this is not right. That's why it's important to read the Word of God in its entirety. Because then you don't just pick and choose what you want. You see the whole heart of God rather than just one scripture and saying, oh, I can get away with that, that's fine. No, it's, it's reading the whole entire word of God. Why? Because we want to be in it for the long haul and not just jump out and say, okay, I'm done because this is just too hard. But there are those unintentional sins, sins that we didn't know about, but then we learn later that, oh boy, that's, that's not right with God. And then there is intentional sin. Now, this is the one that is deliberate. This is the sin that we know of and then we just kind of ah, brush it on the side and say, well, God's going to forgive me. And then we go for it anyway. That's an intentional sin. That's not a mistake. So when we intentionally sin and then we reap the consequences or we're found out or caught, we cannot say, I just made a mistake. No, I have to confess it to God and say, I, I sinned against you. But 1 John tells us, 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. However, if I go to God and say, I'm so sorry, I made a mistake, I'm not confessing no sin to him. I'm confessing I made a mistake. But in God's eyes, you're not confessing your sin. In other words, when you are able to confess sin to God and own it, you take authority over it. Rather than saying, oh, I just made a mistake, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. No, deliberately we deliberately sin, so deliberately mention it to God. Say, Lord God, I sinned. This is what I did. I confess that to you, and I ask you for forgiveness. And the peace of God comes over your life. Amazing what happens. 
But that's when it comes to intentional sin. And he is faithful to forgive us. In the book of Psalm, chapter 19, verses 12 through 13, it says, How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. See, a deliberate sin is actually a word that means proud, arrogant, or to defy proudly. That's exactly what the devil did. Satan himself did that with God. He deliberately defied God in being proud. It was a deliberate act. To intentionally sin is to defy God proudly, which means we know not what, we know what not to do, and then we do it anyway. We know we shouldn't do that, but then we do it anyway. That's an intentional sin. And, and, and what we're saying is we're defying God proudly. That's, a, that's an intentional sin. So to be in it for the long haul means, boy, I got to learn that. I got to learn the difference between the two. And then when it comes to me intentionally sinning, I got to pull back, God. I need your help in this because it's so tempting. And God says, I can help you because I am faithful and I will always meet your needs. James 4, 17 tells us to remember it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. So even knowing what we should do, And not doing it is also a sin. And whenever God speaks something to us and says, this is what you are to do, and I know I need to do that for me not to do it, that's sin. Why? Because it's deliberately going against God and defying God. So it almost sounds like bad news. It's saying, well, how then can I be in it for the long haul if everything I'm I'm going to do is like, it's a sin, like, my life right now, it's almost like I'm deliberately sinning then every single day. Well, here's what Proverbs 24, 16 tells us. And this is so important for us to understand. It says, the godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. But one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. In other words, the Bible is saying, listen, what makes you godly is not that you don't sin. What makes you godly is that you sin and you get back up, not in the context of deliberately, but what you're saying is, Lord, when I've fallen, I've deliberately sinned. I'm going to get back up. I'm not going to do that again. I need your help, God. And you, you be consistent with him because he's going to be faithful with you. Even though you fall seven times, you get up and you go again. And again, you go, you fall, you get up, you keep going because after a while, Years go by, you'll be thinking to yourself, wow, God, you've been so faithful. As much times as I have fallen, you have raised me back up, but I've become stronger and stronger every single time. I don't even think about those things. I don't even do those things anymore. That's my past. And you'll see that come to your life because you've been faithful to get back up again because you're in it for the long haul. And God says, I'm going to show my faithfulness because you're in it for the long way. It's a relationship. Here's the second thing, and here it is, to possess godly values, that you want to possess godly values. To be faithful, we have to have godly values. Otherwise, what are we going to be faithful in? To be faithful means we have to have some type of value system. Something has to guide us. There needs to be some type of parameter helping us along the way. And you might think, parameters, that almost sounds like I'm going to be in prison. No, you're going to be freer than you were before. No, 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 before I could do anything I want. Yeah, that's when you were in prison. But now that you have parameters, you have, you have, you have some, some guardrails, it's going to help you to be freer. Now you, can, now you can live your life according to the will of God because now you have some, you have some guidelines. You have some guidance. It's like, the, it's like going on the highway. Imagine if there were no lines or guardrails. You think that's freedom? No, that's catastrophe. I mean, we already have road rage with lines and with guardrails. Imagine if there weren't any. Yeah, it would be, it would be crazy. But because of God's wisdom, he says, I'm going to give you some parameters and I'm going to give you some guidance. That's freedom. And you're going to be able not just to be in it for the long haul, but you're also going to be able to see my wisdom come into your life. And when my wisdom comes in, you're going to be able to have some values. This is why doing devotions are so incredibly important because this is where we're going to find our value system. It's getting into the Word of God. And sometimes we'll miss a day or two or a month or a year, just get back on track, 
And we have devotions online. You can follow the bookmarker. We have bookmarkers at our information center. We pass them out every quarter in our bulletins. So there's always a way to get into the Word of God. And when you read something, you read a verse, and then after that verse, you just write it down in a journal or something. And you keep tabs on it because you're, you're bringing in all these treasures of a value system that you're going to live by. And so as you're in the Word of God and God speaks something, then you can say, oh, that's so good. I'm going to throw that into my value system. I'm going to have a treasure trove of just values that God wants me to have, godly values, so that when I'm with people, when I'm, when I'm developing relationships and friendships and a new job, a career, my family, I have a value system that I can live by. And when I have a value system to live by, I can understand faithfulness. And I can become more faithful. Why? Because I have a value system to follow. How can can we be faithful to God and others if there's no value in doing so? The book of Proverbs, chapter 28, verse 20, tells us that a faithful man will abound with blessings. A faithful man will abound with blessings. In other words, when faithfulness is lived out, God's blessings pour in. That's just his principle. When faithfulness is lived out, God's blessings pour in. And many of us have seen that with God. And that is the benefit of faithfulness to God and having godly values. In fact, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 tells us to seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. I'm so glad that it doesn't say that God will give us everything we want. Imagine if God gave us everything we wanted. I mean, it, it, it almost sounds like, oh, that would be great. No, it would not be great. Just think in your mind right now if God gave us everything we wanted. Yeah, we, we didn't even know what we want. We have desires. We want to get things. But really, God knows exactly what we need. And so we got to possess these godly values. And then the last thing, and this one is tough because here in Hawaii, we love to talk story. And here it is. Keep my word. If you want to develop this trait of faithfulness, keep your word. Just keep your word. When you say something, mean it. Mean what you say. Now, we're going to slip from time to time because we live, again, in a, in a culture that is all about relationship. So when you don't see someone for a long time, and then finally you see them, and you say, oh, long, long time no see. Hey, we got to hang out. Yeah, we got to hang out more often. Yeah. Hey, we go lunch sometime. Oh, we go dinner. Yeah, let's come to my house. We'll go to your house. We'll go barbecue. Yeah. Months go by. You didn't even talk to each other again. Or you say, hey, I call you tomorrow. Yeah, I call you later. I call you. I call you. You didn't even have their number. It's like we're just saying that almost like for the context of the talk that's happening right now. But if we're going to say something, then we're going to have to follow through with it. And that's the tough part because sometimes we say things in the moment because it just feels right. And sometimes we say things and we never keep our word. In Proverbs 2025 tells us, don't trap yourself by making a rash promise to God and only later counting the cost. In other words, God is saying, you know, you know when you speak words because you represent me? It's actually words that you're giving to me. So when you're, when you're speaking these words, just keep your word. This is, this is what happens when we don't keep our word. Today, we have these things called contracts. We pay lawyers, well, not, not me, I pay no lawyer, million, people pay lawyers millions of dollars when there is a business acquisition that is worth billions and sometimes millions. Why? Because of people's words. They don't trust their words, so you got to write it on a piece of paper, a thick piece of paper, and you read it, you can't understand it, so you have to give it to a lawyer who understands lawyer talk, and then you trust that guy, you pay him big bucks or her, and then you say, where do I sign? And then you sign it. And that signature represents that this contract I'm going to hold to because words are not enough anymore. And God says, here's here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the first deal. I'm going to send myself. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to bargain myself, die for you on the cross, and I'll show you that I will keep my word. And he did, and he continues to do so. If you ever want to see faithfulness, just look to the face of God because he's always been faithful. 
And for us, when we said yes to Jesus, we are actually saying, I am going to be your disciple. Now, I know we use the word Christian, but really that word Christian came after the disciples went to a place called Antioch, if you read the book of Acts, that they were labeled Christians because they were followers of Jesus Christ. But really, we're disciples of Jesus Christ, which is a learner, which means we learn from Jesus Christ. He is our teacher. He is our Lord, our Savior, so he's going to teach us and we're going to follow after him. And part of being a believer when we said yes to Jesus was saying yes to being a disciple, to learn from him and then to carry out the great commission found in Matthew 28. And it reads this, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What Jesus is saying is, faithfulness is not necessarily dependent on you alone as a believer. Faithfulness is dependent on me as your God in faithfully carrying you out in the Great Commission. That you would rely on my faithfulness more than you do your very own. Why? Because I keep my word even when you don't. So when you go out into all the world and teach others about me, you're just doing what I did and what I've commanded you to do because Jesus is the perfect example of faithfulness. That's why the fruit of the Spirit is it's actually the fruit of His Spirit. That's what it is. It's the fruit of His Spirit. He is faithful. And when God teaches you and I something, it's our responsibility to actually teach that to someone else. In other words, we're keeping our word with God when we became a believer to say, Lord, I'm going to now teach those who you have put in my care. Not in some formal environment, but I'm going to model that to people. I'm going to exemplify faithfulness to other people. I'm going to teach that through my lifestyle. Or there may be some teaching moments with our children or with one another, but really it's going to be my life that teaches people about what faithfulness looks like. And when Jesus lives in and through us, then we can really see what faithfulness is going to be like because he says, I'm going to give you the responsibility now to go out into the world and teach everyone everything that I have commanded you. But don't forget, I'm going to be with you because I am faithful. That's why in 2 Timothy 2, 2, we use this as our, we call this our discipleship, like our model of discipleship. 2 Timothy 2, 2, Paul the Apostle was saying this to Timothy because he was telling Timothy, discipleship is really not me teaching you. It's me teaching you and you teaching someone else. That's the full orb of discipleship. It's not just someone teaching someone. It's someone teaching someone to teach someone. That's what Jesus did with his disciples. He said, I'm going to teach you, now teach others. That's discipleship. That's why we have rooted and growing. Because we teach, and then they're going to teach. And then when you learn, you're going to teach. It's what discipleship is. This is our so-called word with God when we said yes to him. We're going to be a part of who you've made us to be. Who else is going to do this? One pastor alone cannot reach the world. You can reach your world that you're in far greater than I could ever because you're always around those people that you're with. Now, you may not preach to them in a setting like this, but through your example you can. Why? Because you're faithful. You're faithful to who God made you to be. And so 2 Timothy 2.2 tells us, The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others. This is why we involve people. This is why we have discipleship. This is why we, we have settings like this. This is why we teach our younger people, our youth. And this is why we have leadership. And this is why we have volunteers. It's not just so that they can play an instrument or be with children or, or clean the kitchen or serve dinner or, or put trash away. Everything we do is discipleship. That's why we're in it for the long haul. Because God is teaching us something. I've learned more in ministry, serving in ministry at every nook and cranny than I would if I just attended church. Because when you're serving side by side with people who are not like you, who are so different than you, you learn quickly how to adjust and you get into the word of God because you're saying, oh boy, Lord, I, I'm having a hard time with, I'll just throw out names, I'm having a hard time with Bunny Correa. I need you, Jesus. Well, what can I, what can I do? And then he says, well, you need to love people. 
Okay, but that's, that's difficult because sometimes she hard head. Okay, Lord, help me love Tom Krieger. How can I love Tom Krieger? Bug a hard head. Well, you need to do. So it's like when I have difficult times, I got to get into the word of God. And it's never having a difficult time in ministry. It is always with people. Just like at your workplace. You, you get hired to do the job that you love. You go there because you love and have a passion for what you want to do. Or because there's a paycheck. Okay, let's just get real. I get, I get, I get him paid. So you, you, you work there because of that, but you usually leave there because of a person, because of people. Even if you love working at a place, you oftentimes leave because of a person. No different in ministry. We'll serve because we love God. We leave because we have a hard time with people. And God says, that's going to be the area of faithfulness. You're gonna, that's where you're going to be tested. It's side by side with people at work, at home, in the marketplace, at school. It's going to be with people. We never have a hard time with people when we're by ourselves. If you are, go to the doctor. <laughs> I'm just saying. When it comes to faithfulness, God says, I'm going to show you how faithful I can be. Because... Without faith, it is impossible to please God. He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Amen. And close your Bibles and put away your notes. There's a story that I, I came across, and I'm going to invite uh, Grayson to the keyboard. This, is, this story that I came across was it was such a, a, a wonderful story because it, it, it shows faithfulness. And I now tie it into, to, of course, what we're talking about tonight. But his name is Oscar Martinez. Oscar Martinez is Disneyland's oldest employee who celebrated 60 years of service at Disneyland in California this past December. Oscar is 81 years old. And he began at Disneyland on December 29th, 1956 as a busboy at Fantasyland. And the park had only been open for a few months. Well, Oscar soon became famous for his delicious breakfast potatoes. And in 1967, Disney Parks and Resorts said he was hired as a cook for Carnation Cafe on Main Street, USA, which has unbelievable malt shakes. Just wanted to throw that out and he's been working there ever since and over the last half century oscar has trained thousands of cast members and has become a favorite of many guests who visit him year after year but this past year on december 29th oscar became the first disney parks and resort cast member to ever achieve a diamond anniversary milestone first ever he walked with walt disney and talked with Walt Disney himself. Martinez is still working at, Ca at Carnation Cafe, which serves Oscar's Choice, a breakfast dish named in honor of Oscar and his world-famous potatoes. Oscar has no plans to slow down, he says. He says, I'm not ready for retirement, and I don't want to talk about it because it's way off. And he concludes saying this, Walt Disney said to follow the dream, and that is exactly what I'm doing. One day we're at Disneyland and Heidi and I were eating at Carnation Cafe and um, here comes this, this cute old man and he comes to our table and says, how is everything? I say, oh, it's great. I love this malt shake. This is like the best ever. He says, yeah, we use premium ice cream. I said, yeah, you, that's really good, so thank you. And he says, hi to Heidi and then he moves on and he's talking to all the different guests. Well, our waiter comes over, and his name was Phil, I believe, right? And uh, he says, hey, do you know who that was? I'm like, no. He said, that's, that's Oscar. And we're like, okay. And then he gave us the story. And then we said, we need to take a picture with this guy. And so this is Oscar. He's 81 years old. Such a, such a faithful man. Faithful. People go to Disneyland and specifically visit this man 
and people pick his brain because he walked with Walt Disney himself. Now, I, I look at this man and, and what an honor to meet with him and talk with him and, and, and of course, you know, seeing the life that he has lived and, and the faithfulness that he has been at, at Disneyland. And then I thought, Lord, you have stood the test of time. You created everything and you walked this earth and then you died for us on the cross. Then you rose from the grave. And then you gave us an opportunity to receive eternal life. Lord, I, I want to thank you for your faithfulness. And I, 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 want, I want people to meet me one day and, and, and say, wow, you, you talk about the Lord in such a way that it's like you walked with him. That there's this relationship with God that is like no other relationship. And it is simply only because of God's faithfulness. He is so faithful to meet our needs. The spirit of faithfulness is lived out because Christ died for you and I. It's the only way we can be faithful is because of a faithful God who celebrates more than 60 years. He celebrates eternity. Can you pray with me? Bow your heads for a moment. Heavenly Father, we know that eternal life is given to us because of what you've done. And so tonight, Lord, just with this word faithfulness, we know that you have given us a, an example of being faithful. You, you're in it for the long haul. You knew what you were going to do, and it was for eternity. And so give us that kind of heart, Lord, that we would be in it for the long haul. Give us a heart to know you, a heart that says, Lord, we want, we want to be faithful to you, that we would be men and women who not only love you, but, but we possess these godly values, that we, we seek your face, and that as we get into your word, that we would put into our hearts your values that we would be people who keep our word when we're going to say something we follow through with it or if we're not going to follow through with something Lord then we won't say it but can you give us that spirit so that we can learn what it means to be faithful and then at the same time Lord we're so grateful that you have kept your word you have been faithful to meet our needs and you have been faithful throughout the ages to show us the way to eternal life. And so we thank you for being our God who is so faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all said together, amen. Let's thank our Lord for being a faithful, a faithful father, a faithful God, and a faithful friend. You know, we have a couple more weeks with this series. And, and I pray that as we learn together the fruit of the Spirit, that not only would we grow together, but really dig deep into our hearts and in our souls and say, God, I, I really want to learn what faithfulness is all about. Because without God, there is no faithfulness. But with God, we can be faithful people because he is, His faithfulness is great. This is what we believe. Amen.